It is with uh, great pleasure that I get to introduce my good friend, Dr. Katherine Schuster. Uh, and so Dr. Schuster is an associate professor now, congratulations, in pediatrics uh, rehabilitation medicine for the University of Louisville um, in the Department of Neurosurgery. She is dual board, uh, boarded and certified in PMMR as well as pediatric rehabilitation medicine. She obtained her medical education from the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine and completed her residency at the University of Louisville, following that a fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, she was named uh, 2019 Louisville's 40 Under 40, which is an excellent honor. Um, and she has become the program director for physical medicine and rehab. Uh, and what people uh, probably don't know is that today is match day. And so congratulations on match day, Dr. Schuster, and thank you for joining us to give this talk. Um, she is also working on her master's degree in clinical health, health professionals education, uh, Dr. Schuster. Oh, Dr. Barton, that was so kind of you. Thank you. Happy match day to you too. Um, after this, uh, we have at noon, we find out our um, five applicants who will be joining us. So I'm very excited. Um, I will share my screen, I think, which is right here. No, it did this the last time. Oh my Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm so sorry. I did, I did a test with Emily and it didn't work. Now do you see it's it? It's there. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so sorry. I even did this yesterday. All right. Um, so I am Catherine Schuster, and I'm a pediatric rehabilitation physician, and I'm going to try in 20 so minutes summarize um, how I approach a child with cerebral palsy. Um, so our objectives today are to identify rehabilitation treatment strategies for children with cerebral palsy and formulate recommendations for treatment plans based on severity, underlying pathology, and anticipated function. And so listening to the previous talks, it's been really nice because I think each of the previous uh, presenters have kind of talked a little bit about their perspective of things that I'm going to try to tie together on how we can work together to provide uh, treatment strategies and recommendations for our sometimes very complex and shared patient population. Um, I have no disclosures. So I'm going to start with just uh, two patients, um, and I am not trying to enter in any kind of uh, discussion. These children have CP for the purposes of this, uh, of my two patient presentation, um, but just comparing the two different stories. So we have a six-year-old male with a history of 32-week prematurity. He has PVL on his MRI with a mild delay in global milestones, and on examination, ambulates up on his toes with a mild crouch and falls when he runs due to a scissoring gait pattern. He's otherwise healthy with no other medical comorbidities and doesn't really see any other physicians. Then we have another six-year-old male who has a history of a traumatic birth with diffuse hypoxic injury on MRI, who's dependent for all care, um, demonstrates severity in all of his limbs, and has a lot of comorbidities, including seizure disorder, neuromuscular scoliosis, trait tube dependence, and cortical visual impairment. So kind of keeping these two patients in mind, um, how does the treatment approach differ between these two patients? They're both six-year-old boys. They both have some problems with their limbs, um, but what do you do and how can you uh, make a unique treatment strategy for those two um, young men? Um, I'm not gonna review the definition of cerebral palsy because I think we've talked about that quite enough, but the question in my mind is I have a patient who comes into my office with one of those stories or something different. And so what I want to know is what's the underlying cause of the cerebral palsy? So that can help guide um, what I think I'm going to see and what I think might happen, um, what parts of the body are affected, and then what is the predominant movement pattern? Because treatment strategies are different for all of those things. So why do they have cerebral palsy? Um, I'm not going to read all of these. We all, um, we've talked about this quite a bit, but um, I think it's worth mentioning that the number of children with CP is increasing due to improved survival of premature infants. And there's a higher incidence of normal weight infants um, with cerebral palsy and they're living longer, which both Dr. Burton and Dr. Harris touched on in terms of adulting with CP, which is a totally other very extensive topic that would be fascinating to talk about. Um, and so looking at the classification, um, these are the things that I think about every time I see a patient, um, kind of grouping them along this continuum. So classification by movement pattern. So what is the predominant movement pattern? And it can be a mixed picture. They can have components of some or both or all of these things. Um, 
by anatomic distribution. So is it an arm and a leg? Is it both legs? Is it both arms? Um, and how does that affect um, your thought process for treatment? And then this is uh, really one of my favorite because as a rehab physician, what I want to do is optimize function and quality of life. So by addressing these different functional scales, we are able to do our best job to promote the unique needs of that patient. Um, so we have the GMFCS, the MACS, the CFCS, the EDACS, and then the newly, relatively newly made, the visual function classification scale. Um, what's really nice about all of these scales is that they're one to five with one is minimally affected. So they're all along the same scale, one to five. One is minimally affected and five is completely dependent for that skill set. So a five GMFCS, MACS, CFCS, EDACS, and VFCS would be a patient who's dependent for all mobility using a manual chair, limited or no head control, no functional ability to manipulate objects, no reliable means of communication, both expressive and receptively, and unable to eat or drink safely, as well as having no means of visual um, recognition, even with adaptations. So moving into treatment strategies, and I preface this by saying that I'm each one of these different subsets that I'm going to talk about have uh, could be a, a topic in and of itself. So I'm going to try and highlight some of the things that I think are unique or uh, worth kind of honorable mention. Um, and then I'm happy to further discuss anything if people want more details. Um, so as we've really highlighted today, uh, CP patients require a multidisciplinary approach and having all of these people interested and willing to provide the best care to improve outcomes for our patients is really um, the most important. So these are not in any kind of specific order because for every patient, I, I have kind of a mental list where I'm running through, do they need this, 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 or this, and kind of pick and choose based on the presentation. So first, um, talking about treatment strategies uh, for uh, specifically related to therapy. So, um, in terms of therapies, what kind of therapy? So this means physical occupational speech therapy, but this also means the types of underlying um, schools of thought within therapy. Um, how often are they getting therapy? And then where can they get it? So as a rehab physician, um, I have an inpatient rehab unit. And so we admit patients to the hospital and they're getting intensive therapies. There's home-based therapies. There's now virtual therapies. There's outpatient therapies. There's acute care hospital therapies. So what is the best location to help our patients? Um, so just special mention, because I get asked about this a lot. So constraint therapy, constraint casting. Um, this is a motor-based learning approach. Um, and the classic definition of this is that you restrain the unaffected limb for three hours a day, three hours of skilled therapy a day for two weeks. Um, but there are modified versions of this where you use um, not necessarily a more permanent cast, but a mitt or a splint or a bandage. Um, with varying degrees of frequency to induce that constraint. Um, we do that here sometimes where we will zip a child's arm into their pajamas. And so instead of um, being free, they are zipped in. Um, there's over, if you do a literature search for pediatric constraint therapies, um, there are over 20,000 articles alone that mention it. And so there's a lot of variability in terms of um, what is the preferred frequency, duration, and method. Um, and how does age impact treatment? What are the benefits of repeated treatment? And then does it matter how much structured therapy you, prov you provide if you're putting a constraint on someone um, versus if you're putting a constraint on them and then just asking them to go about their daily life? And so you have to know a lot about the patient and have a thought in terms of the motivation and the, of both the child and the parent or their family uh, to make this, I think, more successful. Um, so stretching and strengthening are two things that we kind of always talk about, and it's a thing that people, you know, will toss out and they'll say, okay, well, make sure that you're doing your stretching and working, stretching and working on strengthening exercises, but what's the evidence to support doing that? And so, um, contractures, um, can interfere with comfortable positioning, functional activities and care needs. And so by stretching, um, you are decreasing that contract risk um, and so making the quality of life improved for the patient. It is recommended daily, but what evidence is there to support the type and the duration and really there is not a consensus. So sustained versus manual stretch is manual is sustained stretch better. 
Um, and serial casting would be a version of sustained stretching where you are just providing that constant stretch um, either with uh, botulinum toxin injections or not. Um, and something that I found to be very interesting when I was looking into this, so and I, I wanna say maybe back in the day, but I don't know that it was all that long ago. Um, stretching was actually, or I'm sorry, strengthening was actually not recommended for uh, patients with cerebral palsy because it was thought that that would worsen the spasticity, but actually it's been demonstrated to improve overall motor control. Um, and interestingly, even in children who have hemiplegic CP, where they have a uh, quote unquote normal side, that normal side has been demonstrated to be weaker than age match controls. So keeping an eye on both sides of the body, even though the primary problem uh, is on one. Um, Next, moving into bracing, and, and I, uh, this, this is a extremely wide and variable topic, a topic, and um, I'm just going to touch on kind of a few general things and general considerations that I have when I um, talk to a child and a family about bracing. So the questions that I'm thinking about are what kind of bracing do you want for that child? What do you want it for? Are you trying to promote function, promote positioning, provide static stretch? Do you want them to wear it all the time? Do you want them to wear it with specific activities? Do you want them just to wear it at night? Um, and so by thinking through those kinds of questions, I think that will help better guide what kind of brace you might be recommending for the patient. Um, and as I've learned um, in the time that I've been doing this, it's very easy to make a recommendation um, because it's not me wearing the brace. And so having those candid conversations with your families, I think overall comp um, increases compliance, but um, at least I like to think so. So what is, a, what is a brace? I mean, I think it's that's an important thing to know. So uh, the definition of a brace is that any device applied to the external surface of an extremity that provides better positioning, immobilizes, prevents deformities, maintains corrections, relieves pain, mobilizes joints, exercises parts, or assists or supports weakened or paralytic parts. So a brace, as you can see by this definition, is a lot of things. Um, the general goal is to correct, limit, or prevent deformities. And to affect a joint position, the brace has to cross that joint. Um, there's a lot of physics that goes into that. So some strategies to think about specifically as it relates to um, ankle foot orthoses, which are AFOs, um, and how they improve gait in uh, patients with diplegic primarily CP. Um, and so there was a study that was done that looked at AFO uh, wear and gait parameters in children with cerebral palsy. And they used various configurations of AFOs and um, they found that overall those designs normalize the ankle kinematics and decrease energy expenditure. And as anticipated, if there is a hinge within your brace, you had, you had better ankle motion. Um, they did not show that some of the fancier tone reducing features made mechanics any better. Um, but again, I think that this is a very individualized conversation because there have been times where a, a patient has a brace and it makes their gait look much better, even though it doesn't fit with the underlying thought process behind why you would pick that brace or not. Um, and not surprisingly, children will choose the lightest, smallest, and least restrictive brace even in the absence of significant differences in gait parameters or energy expenditure. Um, so I don't think that that's surprising to anyone. Um, medications, so again, this is a very broad topic. I'm really only gonna touch on two specific medications today. Um, this is certainly not meant to be comprehensive of all the possible medication options that you use in management of patients with cerebral palsy. So again, the questions are what, break, what medication do you want to look at and use? What are the possible side effects of that medication? And how are you going to give them that medication? So some medications don't come in liquids or they have to be compounded. And so families have to find a compounding pharmacy. Um, they don't, because pediatric medications are weight-based, um, the weight of the child plays a large role into this and how you're going to best be able to give them the medication. Do they take everything by mouth? Do they have um, an enteral feeding access? And so how are you going to get that medicine to them um, most effectively? So the two medicines that I want to briefly talk on are baclofen and diazepam, although that could, this could really be expanded to benzodiazepines um, in a broader context, but uh, diazepam is the most commonly used medication that we use uh, for spasticity. Um, 
when we're using that class of medications. So both are GABA inhibitors. Um, Baclofen can cause sedation, constipation. Um, it can cause urinary retention at higher doses. Um, it does have a relatively consistent half-life. Diazepam, um, also as a GABA inhibitor, can cause a lot of CNS depression and has a more variable half-life. There was a 2016 study that compared the two medications and they showed that there were both improved spasticity for their patient population. Um, and they were found safe to use and there was not any established difference between the two drugs. Um, diazepam can be used in much smaller children, so like under one versus baclofen, it can be a little bit challenging to dose under one. Every state has different rules about liquid baclofen, um, and Kentucky uh, has some pretty stringent ones, making it very difficult to dose baclofen as a liquid rather than a tablet. But that's a prolonged discussion um, for another day, and lots of people have opinions about that. But baclofen, I would say, is the most common medication that we use uh, for spasticity management. Um, so talking about things that we can do that are for more focal spasticity management, um, there are kind of two main or two broad categories of things we can do, which are botulinum toxin injections and then phenol neurolysis. Um, and I was actually, uh, there's a forum I'm in on social media and there was just a whole long discussion about an insurance company did not want to pay for um, injections for focal spasticity because they, the patient, they felt the patient needed to fail a systemic medication. And so the discussion about the difference between a focal treatment strategy versus systemic one was really fascinating um, in you know, my nerdy kind of way. Um, so neurotoxin, which is botulinum, it acts presynaptically to inhibit the release of acetylcholine, uh, weakening the force of the muscle contraction. It can last about three to six months. This is the exact same um, medication that is being used cosmetically. I have patients ask me that all the time. Um, and I, I think some families are kind of tickled that their child is getting um, the anti-wrinkle injections. Um, and then alcohol blocks with phenol at motor points of selected muscles um, to induce axon necrosis. Uh, the nerve selection is very important because you want to target nerve, I'm sorry, uh, motor only because otherwise you can have sensory issues um, from the denaturation. Phenol can last a lot longer. Uh, in general, to do alcohol blocks, the patient needs to be sedated. They need to be very still. You need to find that motor point and have um, good impulses uh, to best um, do that procedure, which can be limiting for some families who don't want to be sedated. So the goals of uh, botulinum toxin specifically are to reduce spasticity, um, improve passive and active range of motion, reduce pain, and improve care. Um, you can do multiple different guidance methods, so anatomic, just knowing the anatomy of where things should be, electrical stimulation, um, EMG, and then ultrasound guidance. Um, and it can be done sedated or in the office. Uh, so there's multiple different routes to use um, and you can kind of tailor that for each patient. Um, so this isn't necessarily a treatment strategy, but something that I'm always thinking about when a patient comes into my office. So hip and spine monitoring. Um, so why is this important? When to check, when to repeat it, and when to refer to our um, friendly pediatric orthopedic surgeons. Um, I think one of them is talking next, so I'm sure that she's going to speak more to this. Um, so just briefly, um, you can have all manner of hip and spine abnormalities um, with uh, severe spasticity. And so um, you can have hip dysplasia with underdevelopment of that hip joint subluxation that can begin as early as two, where that ball is slipping out of the socket. Um, can have hip instability, the hip can dislocate, and then you can have um, effect onto the actual direction of your, um, of your femur, affecting the position of your entire leg with that muscle imbalance and the hip issues. Um, not surprisingly, there is a linear relationship between more severe CP and the risk of hip-related issues. Um, so up to 90% of patients with GMFCS5 cerebral palsy can have um, hip dysplasia. Um, and then with spine, um, again, there is a, a linear relationship between severity of uh, cerebral palsy and degree of scoli and risk of development of scoliosis. Um, and so up to 80% of GMFCS5 patients can develop clinically significant scoliosis. And so um, 
The consensus is that every child with cerebral palsy should have a hip and spine film done around age two. And then the further follow up of those images are really going to be dependent on um, what you see on those initial images and the severity of the cerebral palsy that they have. Um, so some are yearly, some are every six months, uh, some are, you know, more frequently because there is a dramatic change. Um, I tend to refer to orthopedics, I think maybe earlier than is absolutely necessary, but I think that it's easier to broach the topic of a conversation about it, about a larger surgery, such as um, uh, the hip surgeries or scoliosis fusion, when you've met someone and had a relationship with them rather than, oh, you need surgery now, go meet my friends. Um, so that's kind of how I practice, but we also have a really good communication between both of our groups. And so I think that that works well. Um, and then tone reduction surgery. So I don't do these surgeries, but we do help handle kind of the after effects of all of that. So it's important to know. So the two surgeries that I'm referring to in this situation are selective dorsal rhizotomy. Um, and then I hope Dr. Munchik is gonna talk more about ventral rhizotomies and then intrathecal baclofen, which while full of possible complications is really one of my favorite um, things that we can offer our patients. So intrathecal baclofen is a pump um, that delivers baclofen in micrograms rather than milligrams into the CSF. Um, so that it can be titrated in a dose dependent way for whatever the patient needs. And because it's going right where the receptors are, um, you're not getting as many side effects. The official criteria for baclofen pump implantation are confirmed spasticity that interferes with quality of life that is not adequately controlled with other measures. Family has motivation and ability to attend follow-ups because those pumps need to be refilled regularly. Um, and the patient is large enough to accept the size of a pump. Uh, generally, you need your, it's about the size of a hockey puck to fit in between your pelvis and your rib cage. Um, so I use it kind of measure by my fist. Um, selective dorsal rhizotomy is a neurosurgical procedure that uh, lesions the sensory nerve rootlets to decrease that reflex arc. Um, one of the big kind of controversies and conversations in rehab is about patient selection for this surgery. Um, general accepted consensus is three to eight years old, although we have done both younger and older, um, with GMFCS levels of three and four. Um, one of the things that is the most important about uh, planning for this surgery is that it often unmasks lower extremity weakness um, that makes the child look worse than they started because the tone is now gone when they were depending on that for mobility and now they have to work on more typical strengthening. And so that's a big discussion to have with your families before they engage in that surgery. Um, so that was a very brief whirlwind overview, but kind of going back to our two patients, one was spastic diplegic cerebral palsy and one was spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy. GMFCS2 and then all of the others are ones. And then our other young man is GMFCS5 across the board. So things to think about, even though they are, you know, the same age and they present, you know, I might see one at one o'clock and one at two o'clock. And so how to change your focus for what's going to be the best um, to meet the needs of those two young men. Um, and then I put this in at the end. I know it kind of doesn't fit, but this is probably one of the most common conversations and questions that I get asked when I see a patient with cerebral palsy. So will my child walk? Um, and so the best predictors of ambulation are dependent on the presence or absence and persistence of primitive reflexes, the degree of gross motor development that they have, and the type of cerebral palsy. So persistence of primitive reflexes is a negative predictive prognosticator for ambulation. Um, sitting by age two is kind of the classic board example. It's almost always on PM&R boards in some fashion. Um, and then intellectual impairment is a negative prognostic factor. Uh, hemiplegic CP generally has the best chance of ambulation with near 100%. Diplegic most will and quadriplegic with a, with a wide range. When I have this conversation with my families, what I do try to talk about um, is that we need to define ambulation because I think a lot of times they come and they think about ambulation like a typical able-bodied person. And so um, defining that context for them and making sure that we are doing everything we can to support mobility in a way that makes sense for the family and the child. I know I didn't talk at all about adaptive equipment and different kinds of um, mobility aids, but uh, that is something that goes into that discussion.
So that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. Does anybody have any questions for me? Um, I'll ask one question that I think uh, comes up a lot and I know is a question that you get frequently, uh, but when should these patients come see you? Well, you know, I mean, I think it's always sooner rather sooner rather than later to know the families. Um, but you also have to think about kind of developmental progress. So a six month old who doesn't have a lot of symptoms, but you anticipate things are going, they're going to have problems and need PM our involvement. Um, I would say make the referral, but knowing that they might not get seen until they're closer to a year. Um, but if you're thinking that they're going to have spasticity issues, I would want to see them as soon as you're thinking that that's something going on. Um, because there are things that you can offer in terms of promotion of developmental progress that maybe not everybody else is thinking about. Um, and then just having an avenue of another physician that families can have those discussions with um, for child development and things like that. So I don't think there's a great answer, but I would like to see them as soon as you think it. So thanks, Dr. Burton. I thought that was a, that's a question we talk about a lot. So I thought that was good to add in there. All right, perfect. Well, we will, um, oh, hold on. We have, do have a question. Um, so those are what, two really good questions. Yeah. So um, uh, yeah, well, I'll let you take them. <laughs> so the first question about dystonia, I would love to have a larger conversation with you about that because we go back and forth for patient selection about, so the question, I'm sorry, let me, I don't know if any, can everyone see those questions? I don't know. I, I can I can read them. Uh, so uh, the first one, um, so just an excellent question here is uh, I'd um, like to hear about dystonia unmasking with uh, selective dorsal rhizotomy and how that might affect decisions for SDR candidacy. You know, and that's I think certainly a larger conversation that so we have we, without getting into too much details, we have a big group consensus discussion with orthopedic surgery, pediatric neurology, myself, and pediatric neurosurgery, where, as well as supportive PT, OT, speech um, therapists who kind of look at the, the whole picture and make that kind of group consensus. And I have to say that because we've done this as a group discussion, um, and not, uh, we're not trying to make rash decisions that we have had really good selection and teasing out those kids who might have underlying dystonia that would not um, be the most appropriate rhizotomy candidates. Um, but yeah, I have seen that where kids have gotten a rhizotomy uh, other places or, or, you know, they moved here from somewhere else and um, they tell me they had a rhizotomy and all I see is so much dystonia. And that, as you know, is very hard to treat. Um, so I, hopefully that answered your question a little bit, but I'm happy to talk further. I think any of us are, cause it's a discussion that we have once a month <laughs> when we have our clinic. Um, Renee did ask a question about how do I, how do I say, like, how do people know what PM&R is, um, and differentiate between not being a physical therapist or a uh, psychiatrist or a podiatrist. Those are things that people all confuse us with. Um, but really what I tell people is that I'm the doctor that helps facilitate your function and quality of life. And I supervise and kind of overlook and connect all of those pieces for you. Um, I've had families come into clinic visits and they're like, are you going to do my therapy now? Um, and so having that conversation, um, it's not always easy, but I, I feel like I've gotten better at it the more times I've been able to practice it. So that's, I mean, if you're like wanting to refer someone to a PM&R physician, um, I, that's how I would say it, that they're, they're the function and quality of life doctors and they'll help supervise all of those things. And then Renee asked one more question and this is probably, this is a super hard question, uh, but what age do you begin transitioning to adult care, 18 or 21? Um, so I kind of start the conversation around 16, you know, like, hey, we have to be forward thinking for the future. Part of that has to do with guardianship issues. Um, if they need to, the family needs to establish guardianship over the child. Um, and then what I typically do, and that's because of the setup here, and I'm very, very lucky, is that I transition myself last. So it's a lot, it's very anxiety provoking for all of these patients that they're moving out of the pediatric world into this brand new adult world where there's a, 
a lot more challenges in care coordination. Um, and so I will kind of let them transition over, come back and, you know, kind of field some of those concerns and then move them onto the adult arm. The really, really, really nice thing that I have here is because I am adult PM&R certified is I can still see them. I can't see them in the pediatric hospital, but we have a way of transitioning some of those ones that you think you don't want to get lost and they really still need a lot of complex care coordination. We have a PM&R resident clinic that I staff. And so I can still see those patients in a kind of unofficial capacity. I mean, I'm, I'm still seeing them as a physician, but it's a way to kind of get around that for those ones that are very, very challenging, which I know is unique. Um, to hear and I'm, I'm lucky that I have that available. So I start the conversation at 16 and try to have moved them out by 21. So it's a five-year process. 